I haven't written in a few days. I wanted to be sure that I had something worth writing about before I did. I think... I think I saw Chuck tonight. I think I saw a few of the people that are supposed to have gone missing. The last four nights have been filled with strange little occurrences. The trees are still moving at night. I can hear their voice boxes, but they seem to be taking great pains to avoid me. I would find them in other rings sometimes, but they stayed put whenever I was looking at them. We'd come to a silent agreement that I wouldn't bother them if they didn't bother me. The weirdness started with a series of strange thefts. I had just gotten to sleep the day after the incident with the trees when I got a call from Carl, the security supervisor. Hey, sorry to wake you. Did you happen to see anyone in the park last night? I started to tell him about the trees. It was on the tip of my tongue to tell him everything. But instead, I told him I hadn't seen another person till Randy got there that morning. Sucks that the cameras went out. The groundskeepers are saying that they're missing two bags of concrete. Concrete? I asked, barely awake as I tried to get my wits about me. It had taken several hours to get to a point where I could sleep, and I was beginning to think I wasn't going to get any before work that night. The sleeping pills had made me extremely groggy, though, and I was having trouble following the conversation. Yeah, two bags and a wheelbarrow. Keep an eye peeled tonight, all right? If someone's sneaking in and messing with the cameras so they can steal things, I'd like it to stop. I told him I'd keep an eye peeled and hung up before rolling over to go back to bed. That night, there was a folder sitting on the desk of the security detail office. Randy tapped it when I came in and looked at me with a worried stare. Carl was here for like half an hour. He says the guys in maintenance are missing some stuff. Yeah, I said with a nod. He told me earlier. A whole bunch of concrete or something, right? More than that now. They're missing wheelbarrows, garden tools, and a whole bunch of weed killer for some reason. Who the hell would steal that much weed killer, I asked, as I took the folder and looked inside. Randy hadn't been joking. Someone had stolen almost 20 gallons of industrial weed killer. It was the kind that could kill damn near anything, weeds included. Something like that used at the wrong time could really mess this place up. I don't know. Carl says keep an eye on the cameras tonight. If they go out again, he wants to know about it immediately. Call him on his cell, even if it wakes him up, he says. Dr. Thurston's pretty upset about all this. Apparently there hasn't been a real theft at the Botanical Gardens in quite some time. He left then, and I got my equipment on so I could start doing my nightly checks. I'd just gotten to the lily pond on my first check of the night when, as if summoned by his name, I saw Dr. Thurston standing around the edge of the pond. He was alone, the guests no more than a few oldsters taking a last walk before they left, and as I came up, he seemed lost in thought. He was mumbling to himself, all while keeping an eye on the pale lady. They seemed to be having a very intense conversation, and whatever he was hearing back, he didn't seem to like it. I'm not gonna let you ruin this place for me, I heard him say, just as I came up beside him. Dr. Thurston? He jumped as if a goose had walked over his grave, but he was all smiles when he turned back to look at me. You gave me quite a fright, he said. How were you settling into night shift? Had any more trouble with fainting spells? No, sir. It's okay, I guess. Awful spooky around here at night, though. Always seems like I can hear voices and catch shadows late at night. Dr. Thurston chuckled. I imagine some of that might change once those damn trees are gone. <laughs> they weren't my first choice, but the educational grant money we got for hosting them has more than helped us pick up some bills around here. They do make quite a caterwauling. He went back to looking at the pale lady, and I joined him in silence for a few minutes before he asked me a strange question. Is she one of the shadows you see sometimes? I didn't know how to respond. Would would he believe me if I told him that I thought the lady statue prowled around at night? He laughed again, putting an old hand on my shoulder. I'm just teasing, boy. You know, this statue was my contribution to the gardens when I became the director ten years ago. I had no idea, sir. He looked back at the statue, 
but his face was an odd mix of pride and contempt. My father had been a lover of horticulture and biology. He'd been something of a botanist himself, you see, scouring the world for strange plants and odd flora. He claimed to have found the statue in an old temple somewhere in deepest India. He brought it home and put it in his own garden and said that it made his plants bloom as the summer never ended. He may have loved the statue, but I lived in fear of it. When he died, I could no longer stand to have that strange statue looking at me whenever I walked the grounds of his estate. So I brought it here, so whatever strange energy it has could benefit the botanical gardens. I'm grateful to whatever effect it has on this place, but I still have a great deal of fear and respect for it. He left shortly thereafter, and I continued my rounds as I made ready to close the gardens for another day. The first few nights weren't so bad. I felt watched as I made my rounds, and I caught sight of things out of the corner of my eyes. The trees, thankfully, did not move again, but something was moving in the botanical gardens. They were normal-sized somethings. People, perhaps, but they were far too quick for me to see. I tried ignoring it, thinking it was more strangeness, like the trees moving. And the next day, there was a new folder on my desk. Maintenance, it seemed, was reporting more theft. Their industrial sprayers were gone, as well as the remains of their weed killer. Someone had also taken the keys to the truck that held their bigger sprayer, the one they used for pest control. Carl and Randy were at a loss, and when Carl asked me again if I'd seen anything, I told him I hadn't seen anything out of the ordinary the last few nights. I should have told him about the feeling of being watched, but I didn't want to seem paranoid. This was a good job, and I really needed to keep doing it. So I put up with the weirdness, and the one about my night, as I had the ones before it. The third night, however, Carl spent half my shift furiously sifting through security footage. Someone had broken into the botany labs, behind the botanical garden, and taken something that Carl couldn't tell me about. It was all very hush-hush, but it was something that we could get in a lot of trouble for if anyone found out about it. The techs signed non-disclosure agreements before they started working on it. It was for a company that would prefer not to be mentioned either. If someone stole it, and the company found out, we could be in for a lot of trouble, and a lot of fines. He left around midnight, having found nothing on the camera besides the occasional bursts of static. The weirdest thing to me was that, in all this time, I'd only run into the lady as she took her evening walk once. I knew that she moved around at night, but I had seen her in her pond pretty much constantly. Don't, don't misunderstand. I didn't want to see her again. Running into her was really the last thing I wanted. But I was intrigued by her intentions and what interest she had in the gardens. After Dr. Thurston's story, I began to wonder if maybe his father really had found something magical in India. Some old totem to a harvest goddess? Or maybe something darker? There was no new report when I came in tonight, but there was certainly something to see. Randy was in high spirits when I came in. He handed me a cup of coffee, sweetened just the way I liked it, and told me how everything had been where it was supposed to be when he'd gotten here this morning. Not that the stolen things had magically returned. We were all still under the spotlight for that experimental thing that had gone missing. But nothing new had been added to the list today, so that was good. I guess maybe the heat had gotten a little too high for whoever kept breaking in. Maybe they found somewhere a little cooler to do their burglaries at. <laughs> I nodded, hoping so. I really hoped I wouldn't have to spend all night looking over my shoulder for whoever had been following me. It was making me a bit paranoid, and that kind of thing will eat at you after a while. I said goodnight to Randy, and after the park was closed, I mostly did rounds and watched cameras. It was only a matter of time before they started blaming me for these nighttime burglaries, and I really wanted to catch something so I could redeem myself just a little bit. As if on cue... I started seeing things dart in and out of the cameras. It was similar to the flashes of static that I saw when the statue moved, but these were definitely movements. Creatures that looked vaguely human, 
would move at the edge of the camera, a little too quick for me to see. Still, my eyes found them. I grabbed my flashlight and decided to go investigate. I knew there wasn't much I could do if they'd come in a group, but maybe just the realization that they weren't alone would be enough to scare them off. I moved quietly through the dark gardens, the overhead lamps creating little islands of light in the murky blackness. I could hear something, but I wasn't immediately sure what it was. It almost sounded like construction, but who'd be doing construction in the middle of the night? The tree voices bombarded me as I walked past the governor's ring, but it couldn't quite block out the sound that I had heard earlier. All the trees were still there, where they should be, so I felt confident that they weren't the ones making the racket. After a closer look, though, I came to the conclusion that no, they weren't all there. Three of them were missing, and I couldn't believe I hadn't noticed them before. They were the three biggest trees in the exhibit, likely having been brought in with several forklifts, and they were all just gone. Had they left on their own? I didn't know, but as I turned my face back towards the noise, I figured I was about to find out. The area around the lily pond turned out to be the source of the noise. I hunkered at the edge of the exhibit and watched as a half a dozen hunkered figures went about their work. They were mixing and pouring concrete, cutting wood and making rough tables, constructing seats out of stone and wood, and building something in the lily pond. I, I couldn't tell what they were. They were only vaguely human, but much too hairy and muscled to be actual humans. The longer I looked, the more I thought I could see horns sprouting from the tops of their curly hair, and I wondered where they had come from so suddenly. The longer I observed them, the more familiar faces there seemed to be. It made sense that they should look familiar. Many of them were faces I'd seen on the posters in the break room, the one detailing missing employees. One of the ones pouring concrete looked a little like the smiling botanist who had gone missing last year, the one lifting a large concrete stone, with one hand no less, looked a little like the middle-aged woman who had worked as a groundskeeper. This could all be a mistake, my mind playing tricks on me, but when I heard something snort behind me, I turned and found someone that there was no mistaking. Chuck was pushing a wheelbarrow, his hair now long and brown, and his eyes like a cat. I could look past the faces, I had only seen them on missing posters, but there was no misremembering Chuck. I'd seen him quite often, and despite the changes to him, I still recognized him. The wheelbarrow made a harsh sound as it fell, the two of us just staring at each other for a few seconds, before I could find my voice. Chuck? Is that you? Chuck looked startled. He took a step away from the wheelbarrow. It looked like he wanted to use his hands to cover himself. He seemed ashamed to be seen like this, and when he spoke, his voice was nothing like the deep baritone it had been before. It sounded like someone pretending at a deep voice, and a falsetto all at once. He sounded like nothing so much as a sentient hive of bees that's learned to speak through some strange sorcery. You shouldn't be here. You're not supposed to be here. Get out. Get out before it's too late. I took an involuntary step back, but got control of myself pretty quickly. Come with me. We, we can go talk to Dr. Thurston. Maybe there's some way he can... No, he said brusquely. I, I don't need saving. But you might. Get out of here. Get out of here before it's too late. There are things happening here that you don't understand. You need to leave while you still can. He looked like he wanted to say more but every word seemed to put him at odds with himself. When a sudden guttural scream erupted behind me, the sound of a beehive falling down a flight of stairs, I turned to find that one of the other creatures had seen me and was pointing at me with an accusing finger. I ran for my life. It's amazing sometimes what adrenaline will do. I could hear the sounds of hooves on concrete behind me, the clatter it made hard to tell how many were after me, Two, three, a dozen, it hardly mattered. I'd watched one of them lift a slab of concrete that looked like it weighed as much as 800 pounds. One of them would be enough to kill me, and I knew it. 
As the security hut came into view, I breathed a sigh of relief before wondering why. A door would be child's play for this gang of Billy Goat's gruff, but it hardly mattered. I made it through and turned to slam it in their faces and got a split-second view of a mob of angry monsters. Their teeth looked huge as they gnashed from their lips. Their arms pumped wildly, and the cords that showed on them bulged dangerously. They were a pack of Bacchanalian revelers, a group of pissed-off satyrs, and I slammed the door and ran the bolt, already having my cell phone out to call for help. 911, what's your emergency? I need help. I need the police, the army, something, to the Kashmir Botanical Gardens. I'm the security officer, and I'm being attacked by something. I, I've... At that moment, something hit the door, hard enough to bow it in its frame, and I saw an arm attempting to poke into the gap. I need someone here now. They're almost through the door. Please, God, help me. They battered at the door as I yelled into the phone, and as the woman assured me that help was on the way, I hung up on her and dialed Carl. He sounded groggy, but woke up quickly once he heard the banging. What the hell's going on over there? Are you okay? I need help. I called the cops, but I need to let you know in case something happens to me. They're working for the statue, the, the one in the lily pond. She's been making them steal things. They're, they're the ones that have stolen all the tools and the concrete and stuff. They're building something. They're, they're, they're making something. I don't know what to do. Slow down, kid. You aren't making any sense. I'll be down there in about ten minutes with everyone I can lay hands on. You stay safe. There's a flare gun in the box under the desk. It's only got one shot, so try not to waste it. And only if you really... His last words were blotted out as something bent the door enough to reach their arm all the way in. I dropped the phone in surprise and backpedaled until I ran into the desk. The hand was like a furry spider, scuttling around the door as it looked for the clasp. The door wasn't much protection at this point. It was bent almost in two, and I wasn't sure why the hand was trying to open it when it could just as easily knock it down. I didn't question my good luck. I just reached for the case Carl had told me about and popped the safety latch as the gauze and band-aids and antibiotics spilled onto the floor. The flare gun clunked onto the desk, and I scooped it up as the hand finally found the latch. I took a shaky aim, though I guess I didn't need to be that good a shot. I've never been much of a marksman, to Dad's chagrin, but as I steadied my hands, I reminded myself that I only had one shot. The thick fingers slipped off the lock, but it seemed that they were more curious to find where it was. As they returned to it, I put a bead on them and pulled the trigger. I missed, but I missed spectacularly. The shot bounced off the door frame and out the large hole the arm was creeping through. I heard a sound that was part goat bleeding and part angry bee swarm, and the arm came out as... Whatever it was attached to beated itself and bellowed. It was joined by the clatter of hooves and the other plaintive cries, and I began to wonder what I would do if the hand came snaking back to that crack again. Luckily for me, I didn't have to find out. As the blue and red lights filled my vision, the creatures took flight. They clattered back down the sidewalk and away from the guard station as swiftly as they had arrived. I sat on the floor flare gun still in my hand and could do little but try to make my teeth stop chattering. I'd never felt closer to death in my life and my breath tried to catch itself as I wondered if it was really over. When the police announced themselves and called out for security staff, I dropped the flare gun and told them I was here. As it turned out, the EMT was the same one from the other day. We gotta stop meeting like this, he said. People are gonna talk, you know? In my current state, I didn't even register the joke. The police had helped me out of the smashed booth and deposited me with the ambulance as they went to check the park. I'd been sitting dutifully on the stretcher, letting him examine me for about 15 minutes, when the headlights of an SUV pinned us both in place. The EMT looked a little nervous as the doors opened, and four others climbed out. Was this some new trick by the pale lady, or was it more cops showing up after the fact? 
To my surprise, it was Carl, Randy, and the new kid, Gabe. At the head of them was Dr. Thurston. They approached the ambulance, and as Carl asked the EMT about my status, Dr. Thurston brought his very old face very close to mine. He seemed to be looking for something, and when he didn't find it, he calmed, and his usual smile emerged like an autumn sunrise. Tell me true, boy. Did she make you drink anything? Did you eat anything? Did you take anything from her? I shook my head and just kept on shaking it until he put a hand on either side of my face and leaned in so close that I thought he was going to kiss me. After a few minutes, he leaned away again. He's just scared, Carl. I don't think she's gotten a hold of him. Well, thank Christ for that, Carl said, signing something the EMT had put in front of him and telling him that they would take it from here. Gabriel, go tell the police that we're taking the security guard to Dr. Thurston's office. If they have any more questions, they can find us there. Gabe nodded, but Carl stuck out a hand before he could go tearing off. And don't run, for God's sake. These cops are going to be tense enough without you spooking them. Come on, kid, he said, putting an arm under me and helping me up. Tell us the whole story. You're still here. I thought you might be. Thanks for joining me for tonight's story. If your insatiable appetite for horror knows no bounds, might I suggest one of our playlists or one of our previous stories in the archive? There should be one appearing at the end of the story any minute now. And of course, if you're not subscribed, why not go ahead and hit that subscribe button? Maybe hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of the spooky things that we do here. If you prefer your horror a little more analog, you can always pick up one of my books. There's a link below to my latest, and it'll take you to all the great things that I've posted on Amazon. For my book lovers in the audience, I always suggest coming on down to Patreon so you can become part of my ghostly reader tier and get a book anytime I write one, which is usually about twice a year. Speaking of my patrons, let's go ahead and thank them. Thanks to Janet for being our Spooky Skeleton Tier contributor, and thanks to Hi Stacy, Winter, Zeronin, Emily Coltsfoot, Stephanie Carrington, Marianne Schuler, Tyler Parker, and Jennifer Damron for being our Ghostly Reader Tier contributors. Thanks, everyone. We just couldn't do the show without you. If you're thinking you might like to become one of my patrons, follow the link below to my Patreon. And as always, however you support the show, I appreciate it. Till next time, Dr. Plague, signing off. Have a wonderful evening.